welcome to Residing in North Idaho. We are a community and lifestyle podcast, sometimes a little bit of real estate because my partner Dave Fowler and I are full-time real estate agents here in North Idaho. And today we have a very special guest. I'm super excited about this conversation. It's been weeks in the making. We have uh, Kootenai County Sheriff Bob Norris with us. Welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Glad to be here. Yeah, this is uh, this is going to be a good conversation. I know we have a lot of people um, that are interested in this area and they're interested for, you know, I guess the politics side of it and the safety side of it. And I thought this would be a great conversation to have you come on it and speak on it personally. Um, I, and along, along with a lot of other people, love sheriffs because they're elected officials and, you know, they don't work for the city council or something like that. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of having a sheriff here. So thank you for coming. Um, can we start off with just kind of like a little bit of your background and, you know, where you came from? Absolutely. So um, I came from a small county south of Boise. It's called Los Angeles. <laughs> there it is. Los, there it is. Los, 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 First Los joke of the day. Angeles, Beautiful. <laughs> I was a young man and uh, working in a private industry and interest rates were really, really high. And my dad was getting ready to lose a business and said, hey, consider maybe doing something else for a while. And I took some courses in college and went over to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's office. I did a 30 year career there. What, uh, what year did you I start see. then so roughly? 1984. So you guys one. were, you were on horseback at that point, right? Oh, <laughs> luckily, luckily. Yeah. I think camel. Just for reference. Sure. I was four years old at that time. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm no spring chicken. My goodness. I know. So yeah, sure. 1984. Cool. And then I did a 30 year career. I retired in 2014, made it up to God's country here and had a small farm south of the river with goats and chickens. And I wanted to join the search and rescue team, join the search and rescue team right here. And sure enough, uh, after a little bit, they said, Hey, why don't you run for sheriff? And I said, no, <laughs> I go, absolutely not. I've never ran for public office, let alone sheriff. Yeah, I'm not interested. And then after few more months of prodding, we said, okay, let's do this. And, uh, you know, while being on the LA County Sheriff's office, I was uh, obviously a jail deputy, a deputy sheriff in the jail. I worked patrol, got my certification as a patrol deputy. Then I was a field training officer that became a sergeant and a lieutenant a department head over two contract cities. So that was my, my experience on the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office. Every aspect of what we do here at the Cooney County Sheriff's Office. So I eventually threw my hat in and we won by the primary by about 20%. And here I am. So you had, I mean, so when you were at the LA, so, uh, I mean, you had that experience. You said you're the head, department head of two contract yep. cities. Yep, Maywood and Cudahy. So, I mean, I, and you're in charge of, I imagine a lot of people for that LA SO is huge, right? Correct. Yeah. So... Well, that's something that people don't realize too, with those larger departments, you know, people say, well, you were never the sheriff, right. but I know a lot of those larger departments with the contract cities, you know, I was with San Bernardino County. There's a lot of contract cities and you have people that, that sit in, in a department, a sub department that's just as big as Kootenai County and other places. And you do have that financial, that fiscal aspect of it, the administration, right. everything. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, it is very it's similar. Very, yeah. Very yeah. Similar. You could have a guy that's a chief in a small Midwest town of 15 officers. Right. And that is not the same right. as managing, you know, hundreds or thousands right. of people and dealing with cars and, you know, patrol vehicles and, and dispatch and jail, all that. Like, it's a lot. Right. And that jail in itself is a, we're operating a small city over here at the right. Cooney County Sheriff's Office. And we have medical services and we have to have food services and we have to have psychological services and we have to have laundry services. So it's like operating a small city because, mm -hmm. and we have to provide security for 500 and 12 inmates. So that's big. That's yeah. big population in there. Yeah. I'm a little bit overcrowded, but yeah. Any uh, plans for a jail expansion? Yeah. Or? Yeah. We, um, we got allocated our money from the board of County commissioners. Thank you. BOCC. And we are hopefully going to start construction in March. Oh, dang. Okay. Uh, same location, just an same expansion. location. Yeah. In fact, it's just the, the shells are already there. So we're just going to outfit them interior. Awesome. What will that boost the uh, ability? Um, well, then I'll have uh, about a 520 capacity. So, <laughs> so, right, so, be... so right now I should be at 360. Yeah. I'm at uh, 
you know, the 500 and plus consistently. And this will put us, put us closer. Is right that now. just a function of a growing population? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. With, with the aggressive growth that we've seen in Kootenai County, then obviously we're going to have a, a, a criminal uh, aspect to that. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's just a part of growth. Okay. With, with growth comes crime. Yeah. So. I think a lot of people don't quite understand that because I, I, I see a lot right. of comments and it's like, oh, you know, I always get ruined and I'm like, well, it's just a lot more people. It's probably the same amount right. of crime per capita. Right. If we can, if we could figure out a way to put a wall on the, the border, <laughs> we do a lot better. And which which border are we talking about? about? The, border between, <laughs> the border between Washington and Idaho. If we could put a, oh. a wall there, then our population would decrease uh, yeah. significantly. So. Isn't that funny? Yeah. What was it? What was the slogan that you had for uh, oh, 4th yeah. of July? Yeah. Yeah, I so did. Good. I have a press release where I uh, just told Washington criminals and Idaho taxpayers that don't come to Kootenai County on vacation and leave on probation. I love it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I remember hearing that. Yeah. yeah. And it's very true. I mean, I, it is true. I mean, you obviously know I met you when I was in law enforcement up here, but um, you know, that was a, a lot of times, especially during the summer when the population swells and everything else, a lot of the criminal activity I dealt with was Washington. 100%. And a lot of our high profile events are from suspects from Washington. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. It just, it draws a crowd yeah. and it is amazing. And I think, you know, a lot of people are going to focus on the fact that, oh, well, you're saying everybody in Washington is bad. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that there's a lot of people over here in Idaho that take pride in this community. And very rarely um, did I have a, you know, major incidents with people that lived in the community that participated in the community. And a lot of people do over here. Yeah. And that's a big difference. I, uh, I almost got in a fight with a guy last year. I was downtown. It was summertime and it was super busy. And this dude's like throwing trash. That's a big, that uh, just sets me off, like throwing trash on the ground. And I snapped and I was like, and then I was like, oh. luckily it was like a younger guy, smaller than me. So he didn't feel like he wanted to bow up and create a situation because my kids were right there. And I was like, I was kind of dumb. I should have just not done anything. But that kind of behavior, I think really like local people really don't like. I yeah. hate seeing that. No, absolutely. Hey, we put our shopping carts back here yeah. in uh, North Idaho. So that is the true judge of a person's character. I mean, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. That is so true. Assimilated, assimilated shopping cart by a cart, not assimilated. You're not out. Assimilated. You're out. <laughs> no. And I think, you know, it's nice that, that that happens because what it does is it creates, uh, I had somebody, uh, there's a guy that owns a gym down in California and, um, it's funny. He's, he's, uh, he's been in and out of jail. He has a background, but he has one of the nicest gyms. I went down there recently and I'm like, man, this place is, it's intimidating. It is the cleanest gym around. And I had a talk with him and he's like, and, uh, he found out that I was former law enforcement and really nice guy. And he turns around and he says, you know, I, I'm, I enjoy being out and doing stuff than, mm. you know, being in where I was. But I asked him, I said, dude, your, your gym is phenomenal. He said, here's the idea. He goes, we don't let people screw with anything here. He goes, you go in a really nice house and you finish dinner. You don't go throw a dish in the sink. He's like, you clean it and you put it in the dishwasher because you don't want to mess up what it is. He's like, we carry that same thing. That's very much what you see up here. People respect. It just comes down to respect. Right. So yeah. people, there is a lot of people that come here and yeah. maybe they have those habits of tossing trash mm -hmm. and they don't do it as much up here because they know that there's a standard and people want it nice. That some They don't want those things. All dude with a beard is going to yell at them. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and belittle them in front of children. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good stuff. Okay. So <laughs> now... As sheriff. Well, can I tell you a little bit how my uh, plain speak Let's career hear it. Oh, as yeah. a sheriff yeah. began? Let's so hear it. I had just won the Republican primary. Idaho is a party nomination state. So every elected office at the county level and above, we start with our Republican party, and then we have a Democrat challenger or libertarian challenger or constitutional party challenger. So... So I was the winner of our Republican primary and I got a phone call from a individual that was a reporter at the Spokane review, Spokane, Spokane review. And he goes, congratulations, Bob Norris. You just won the Republican primary to be the next sheriff. And I said, thank you. And he said, can you tell me what are your thoughts on that horrible event that's been going on <laughs> over there on Sherman in the city of Coeur d'Alene? And I said, well, I, I guess it's horrible if you wanted to see looting and if you wanted to see injuries and if you wanted to see deaths and, and if you wanted to see looting, it was horrible. <clears throat> but 
in my opinion, that was the safest place in America. And he goes, what? And I said, it was the safest place in America. And I said, why would you say that that was a horrible thing? He goes, well, I just don't think that, you know, it should have happened. And I said, well, wait a minute. I go, there's evil in this world. I said, the only reason we didn't have the same events that it had happened in Spokane for the few nights before was because of the people that were out there, the citizens that came out to protect that community. I said, I've been involved in concerts that went out of control. I've been involved in sports championships that got out of control. I was been involved in funerals that got out of control and riots occurred. I was in the 1992 riots and the businesses that protected their property with firearms didn't get looted and nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry that it happened in his view, but we have evil in our community and in, in this country. And the reason why they didn't get looted and nobody got hurt was because of the residents that came out and said, Hey, take this back over to Spokane. This ain't happening here. Yep. And just for anybody tuning in that doesn't know exactly what was going on, um, just for quick references, this was back during when we had a lot of BLM going on. We had a lot of 2020, other 2020 George yep. Floyd uh, riots. Yeah. Right. So we had all that stuff going on. And what we had was we had hundreds. I don't know what the oh, final I, count was. It, I would say even thousands, maybe even thousands of people that came out to Sherman Avenue armed. I mean, there was ARs out there. There were people driving in trucks. Were Everybody you, was wearing, were you working with Corlina. I point? was. Yes. What was the feeling? You know what? Uh, over there, actually, I, I felt like they took a really good um, the, the chief did a really good job over there. I felt, uh, we basically, for the most part, stayed out of it. Mm. You know, a lot of these confrontations that you see across the country are when law enforcement gets involved. People came down here and the last thing that we necessarily needed was having a bunch of law enforcement showing up downtown. Most of the conflicts that happen are between law enforcement and, uh, and whatever group it is or anything else that's, that's marching or doing whatever it is. So we actually stayed very, very quiet about it. And we just, I mean, they were ready. It was an effective strategy. In my, it my was. Opinion, yes. Yeah. We stayed out of it. And honestly, it was a community driven event and it went really well. And I mean, we were on the cover of New York times oh, and yeah. everything else. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the liberal side, you know, they, they, they attach onto that and it's like, Oh, it was militias and this and that. And, and no, like, there was no organ. It was there, citizens that just came out and said, Hey, this and, ain't going to happen here. And there's no, you know, nothing ha like, so I was working still in CHP uh, during the George Floyd riots uh, and I was in Sacramento and that, city was just burning and looting and it was because the mayor gave the stand down order to the uh, sac pd so that's what happens right a hundred percent and in this i mean i fully i think it was an awesome well i like your sure. i like your statement on that yeah it's, and it's Glad true based on experience um right you have I'm that sorry. you know the other uh, side sports celebrations uh lakers that would it, things got out of control looting people got hurt but uh the businesses that protected themselves with firearms they didn't get looted and nobody got hurt. Yep. yep. Uh, my understanding is Antifa did come into town and then tucked tail and, and ran, did. right? Yeah. So yeah. they said, this is a whole different animal. We're yeah. out of here. Yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, that part of my plain speak career, um, I did sign a affidavit during my campaign that I am not going to enforce any red flag laws whatsoever. The second amendment says shall not be infringed and it means it to my heart. It says right. it shall not be infringed and it won't be infringed here in Kootenai County. I will not enforce any federal gun laws or red flag laws. Um, and then let's talk about my first day of my full term. <laughs> man, oh man. So yes, um, got sworn into office and I sent out a press release saying that we're not going to enforce any unenforceable mandates against citizens of Kootenai County. What, oh, so what year you must, did you get sworn in like 20, 20, oh, yeah. 20. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you're right in the middle. It was of happening it. right yeah. in the middle of it. Right in 21. <laughs> and uh, I said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to even have a discussion on how many people you can have in your home. And we will never, never, ever interfere with any religious gathering whatsoever. We saw some pretty horrible things across mm -hmm. this country with uh, law enforcement being weaponized. Oh yeah. Uh, I remember seeing, and I actually think it was Los Angeles. Uh, I remember seeing a guy jogging on the beach and this, I, I think it was a deputy sheriff. This guy confronted this person. There's nobody else on this beach, right? No reason. There's nobody else on this beach and says, Hey, you can't be here. 
And we all remember the woman who was in Ohio that was watching her son play football and she got tased for eventually not wearing a mask. And they asked her to leave and she goes, Hey, it's an outdoor stadium. Why do I, I need to leave? And they actually, a police officer. Tased wow. Her. I didn't see that one. And that's our jury pool. I mean, how are you, we going to have a, a jury in our community mm-hmm. on defendants? And, uh, well, you know, I don't know if I'm believing that officer. Cause I remember what this officer did to me. I kind of believe that the suspect that the officer right. <laughs> exaggerated all these facts. Right. right. Well, I think that's one of those things, and you saw it come into play there, is the fact that we've we've lost touch with what law enforcement is supposed to be there for. Law, I mean, mm-hmm. we've all been on those calls where, why am I here? Why is this an issue that can't be solved somewhere else? And, uh, you know, yes, like you said, weaponizing law enforcement and those types of things is something that's just, it breaks the trust of the community when law enforcement is used in that way. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, and yeah. and, and um, we are still seeing some of the the effects of that, you know. Mm. Do you, do you recall when we had a an event in Southern California, and during that event there was some information that came out, and um, we, we could call it the O.J. Simpson era, we could call it the Rodney King era, when juries didn't believe law enforcement. So then we would have a defendant, we would have video, we would have evidence recovered, we would have a bank note saying, give me all your money. We would recovered the money and we had a confession. They say, oh, no, he's innocent. Clearly all the cops are liars, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, so wow. there was a, uh, a side effect of some of that uh, right. stuff that occurred back there. And we're still having a side effect of some of the stuff that we're not here in, El- in Kootenai County, but certainly right. in other communities, they're still having side effects of some of their actions. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I firsthand got a taste of that because you know as a chp i was basically governor newsom was our head boss um and we you know working at the capitol in sacramento um multiple times were told to stand down when when uh, antifa and blm were trashing it pathetic and then and then forced to uh enforce um people who didn't have a permit that were a conservative crowd that were really doing nothing other than not wearing masks and then we were forced to you know take action on that and it was like a lot of guys at that point were like, what are we doing here? Why? Yeah. Why? Was, I hated it. So, so can I tell you another Please. press release that um, I got labeled a white supremacist and a racist <laughs> and what have you? So, <laughs> so, you know, you're, you know, you're winning the argument, you know, when, when they say, when that. they throw that out, yeah. right? Yeah. That's okay. the- so here, here's, here's one of them. We have two of them, but here, here's one. So is Idaho inching towards California, Oregon, and Washington? And what this has to do with last year, the Idaho legislature considered a bill to give driver's license to illegal aliens. Mm. And I said, absolutely not. I am not going to issue in in Idaho, the sheriff issues driver's license. So I I said, uh, Sheriff Bob Norris said that municipalities municipalities that accommodate people in the United States illegally have more illegal migration. Municipalities subsequently have an increased need for schools, social services, jails, prisons, and law enforcement. Rewarding illegal aliens with a restricted driver's license is essentially a tax on every Idahoan. So coincidentally, I sent out another press release today. So this is the first time. Yeah. This is the first Ooh, time that hot uh, off the press, yes. hot off the press, Sweet. <laughs> dated today, hot off, it here. The, hot off the press. <laughs> Our Idaho legislature is in session right now. They are discussing on what bills they're going to bring forward. So here's what I had to say to them. I said, will Idaho, will the Idaho legislature enact the highest tax increase in the history of Idaho? I like the heading. Mm. <laughs> I hope not. In 2023, the Idaho State Legislature considered a bill that we just talked about. Sheriff Robert Bob Norris said that rewarding illegal aliens with a driver's license will only encourage more illegal immigration to Idaho. If this bill ever passes into Idaho law, it will be the highest hidden tax increase on our state's history. The Idaho taxpayer will be forced to pay for more schools, jails, Mm. prisons, just like it says. And then I do say, 
Sheriff Robert Bob Norris will not issue driver's licenses to any person who entered our country illegally, period. And I did ask the legislators who I've been in communication with to consider other legislation. And that is a including fentanyl as a substance that we can charge for in trafficking cases. Oh. Right now, there's a little bit of a loophole yeah. in the law, and uh, we need to correct that. We need to include fentanyl as a trafficking offense. Absolutely. That's Wasn't one of the- uh, Eric just talking about that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Boardman, yeah. Um, yeah. That's a crazy loophole. It is a crazy loophole. Also, we'd like to see adding or increasing mandatory minimum sentencing to sex crimes against children, violent crimes, and repeat offenders. Agreed. Boom. You know, I want to highlight something you said in there. It's the last word, and a lot of people don't listen to it, is illegally. Right. I don't think in any way what you were trying to do is to take away rights of American citizens. You're just not granting and, our rights to somebody else and, that doesn't belong and here. And people who have come here legally. Right. I'm all in. We already have provisions in Idaho mm -hmm. law to provide a driver's license to people who have come here legally on a visa, HB1, H1, B1. Um, or have their citizenship. I'm, that's not even on the table. People who have come here illegally, I will not issue a license. Yet. Good. And and your goal makes sense, right? The goal is to keep a massive amounts of illegal immigration from happening here, because I think it will undermine the fabric of this community. Oh, absolutely. And it's not a it's not a racist thing. That's stupid. I, people throw that out because they have no other argument, right. and they like to label you that. Um, I get labeled that too on YouTube sometimes, just because I'm conservative. Right. Uh, I am so frustrated that that they can even do that and try to get it to stick. But. Well, I'm not I'm not very political, but I did in seventh grade get voted future politician. But dude, we'll see where that took me. Yeah. Well, um, guess what? Yeah. There's still time. You guess so, years so, so I'll hit a hot button here because a lot of people uh, talk about it, but you know it's a sensitive topic. But when you talk about do politics work? Do these things work? Drive across the border. I've never in my life, you know, down in California, it's the same concrete jungle. Wherever you go, you don't even know what town you're in. A lot of times you got to look for a sign to figure out what city you're in. I have never seen something so polarizing than living here and driving to downtown Spokane, only 30 minutes away, same weather, same environment. Everything's the same. Politics are different. And Dave, what we're seeing, and you saw it down there in San Bernardino, and we're starting to see it in Spokane. And I saw it when I was an exchange student in a foreign country. The difference between the haves and the have nots where everybody has gates on their fences mm. and every, everybody has security gates everywhere, security cameras everywhere. Um, and we're seeing that over in Spokane and you saw it down in San Bernardino. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Mm. So you did mention a press release that I did that got national attention again. I love these press releases. Yeah, oh, can I, can I pause you real quick? Yes, I had a question about the other one. Where do the other sheriffs in Idaho stand with this? Are they with oh, you? Oh, yeah. The yeah. Idaho Sheriff Association, we already had our conference in December, and we are opposing that bill, which okay. will likely come forward again. We're opposing that bill. We want them to add fentanyl. We want them to add mandatory awesome. minimum sentencing requirements. Are they generally pretty good at hearing the voices of the sheriffs in Idaho? You know what? We have a lot of lobbyists and we have a lot of bill makers that say, okay, where did the Idaho Sheriff Association stand on this? Okay, good. And I have legislators that contact me directly and say, hey, what's your read on this? What do you think that the association is going to do? How many sheriffs are there? 44. Okay. Yeah. I so think that's, that's smart number. because yeah. like you said, the sheriff being an elected official and everything else, this is where everything falls. Right. When everything you, goes you, bad. This is who we look to. You are literally potentially the last stand right. of, of, yeah, of law and order, which is, you know, cool. I tell that to my wife and I still have to take the trash out. And <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand this. <laughs> Your home I go, do you know who no I am? Respect. Do you know who I am? When I leave this house, do you know what, how people describe me? No, and I have that. to do the dishes <laughs> and take the trash out? Can we get a video of that? <laughs> we can have that coming soon. Uh, like, coming yeah. soon. <laughs> All right. All right, you hit on this. Once again, we were using statistics. Um, How dare you use facts, I, sir? I, I know. I know. <laughs> from from the year from the year before, we had like forty seven percent, about fifty percent of the people that were arrested during a July Fourth weekend were from the state of. Huh? You guessed it. Yeah, Washington. Yeah. So How, what percentage? 
it, it was, I think it was actually about 50% or higher. Okay. So what I thought I would do is I thought I would do a public service announcement. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. It needs yeah. to be addressed. Yeah. So here's what my public service announcement said. Kootenai County is a preferred destination venue for many Washington residents during the July 4th celebrations. In the past, the Kootenai County Jail has seen a disproportionate number of jail bookings from our neighbors to the west. Neighbors? Yep. That was nice, don't you think? <laughs> Sheriff Robert Bob Norris welcomes our law-abiding neighbors. However, states that controlled substance laws are very different in the state of Idaho than in Washington. Public service announcement type statement, right. right? Okay. Fentanyl, methamphetamine, cocaine are serious felonies in Idaho, and one will go to jail or prison. You know, they don't even enforce that in Washington. Anymore. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah. a ticket, probably. Crazy. So... I did say, unlike Washington, Idaho does not restrict Kootenai County law enforcement from enforcing the law and taking violators directly to the Kootenai County bed and breakfast. That's awesome. Our county jail. <laughs> the message is clear. If one chooses to possess controlled substances or engage in criminal behavior, Seattle, Spokane, and the entire state of Washington is a wonderful place to enjoy Fourth of July celebrations. I love it. Public service announcement, right? The sheriff said, don't come to Kootenai County on vacation and leave on probation. It's really catchy. So I thought that was a great public service announcement. Right. I mean, it's serious, but it's also a little bit funny, which I appreciate. And uh, I, I think it gets the point across, right? And it's accurate. Well, I don't understand how there could be an opposition to that. No. You've oh. never said that people can't come over here and enjoy this. Like, Law-abiding yeah, right. law law citizens, abiding right? Law-abiding citizens. Yeah. Absolutely. You would look at some of the mail that I received and the voicemails, and my goodness, they were horrible. And it's, so what I get this one professor from Seattle. I can't believe that you said that. You are racist, this and mm -hmm. racist that. I don't know. All I said was, you're more likely to go to jail or prison if you do something illegal in Idaho. But if you don't want to go to jail, stay in Washington. I agree. I mean, it's pretty simple. That's pretty clear. That's not racist at all. Yeah, it, it's pretty clear. So, so this is something else that I just recently released. And um, instead of me saying it, why don't, since you brought it up. I'll say it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Why don't you read, read this? It. These are gold. I'm really yeah, enjoying yeah, it. I like this, it. This is actually first time um, released it this week. Okay, here it is. This is an audit okay. from 2022 on for 2021 on the Cooney County Sheriff's Office from the federal, gov federal government. Oh, boy. And go ahead. All right. Just from up here? Oh, right here. Oh, right here. Okay. From background check, the Cooney County Sheriff's Office was not denying on valid NICS indices hits. The NICS indices contain information provided by federal, state, tribal, and local agencies of persons prohibited from receiving firearms under state or federal law. A valid hit in the NICS indices results in an immediate denial. Correct. So this is an Idaho sheriff that's standing up for your rights to carry a concealed weapon. And what if you if an individual had a forgery charge from 20 years ago. And because that for forgery charge when you were 18 or 19 years old would have prevented you from carrying a concealed weapon. Right. And in, in 20 years of good behavior, no criminal history. Yes. I issue that. Um, there are others that I issue concealed weapons licenses for, and that is a sheriff that's standing up for your second amendment right and taking a reasonable approach. Some person who was convicted for tax evasion 20 years ago and has been clean for 20 years. Guess what? Yeah. I, I, so, I can stand behind that hundred percent. That's cool. And this is the enhanced concealed carry. Yep. Okay. So yep. I know these answers, but I want to ask you just so Absolutely. it's coming from you. Yep. Do you need a license to carry a firearm in the state of Idaho? No. Do you need a license to carry a concealed firearm in the state of no. Idaho? So this was a question I was going to ask before we came in. Can you explain to people what is the benefit? I mean, if you're basically not denying it, people already have the right here. 
Correct. If you're not denying that, what is the benefit? I have an enhanced CCW. Okay. What is the benefit of going into the sheriff's department and getting an enhanced CCW? It is good in 38 states in the United States. Okay. If you have an Idaho enhanced, you can go to 38 states. Washington's included in that, right? Washington is included. That's a miracle, or, but it's yeah, good. Right now. Yeah, I don't yeah, for know now, what, I don't know what time it might change. As soon as they listen to this podcast, it might change. <laughs> but um, Oregon, California, Connecticut, uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So I don't that, go there anyway. So yeah, that's, to do down that's there. the advantage. Um, you know, there is something that um, I get a lot of questions on. Got it uh, a couple of days ago. They said, "Hey, what do you think about concealed carry or open carry?" I said, "Well, from a tactical advantage." I, I believe that concealed carry is a more effective way to carry a concealed weapon. Yep. Um, you don't want to be that bad person's first target because if he's looking for a target because he wants to accomplish something that's against the law, he's going to say, oh, look at that person's got a concealed carry. So, Or I'm sorry, he's open carrying. So do I prefer from a tactical advantage? Yes, yep. concealed carry. Because yep. you want that element of surprise. Right. I mean, you always want that. So yeah, be, yeah. be the gray man. I, I, I have, I talk about this a lot in my videos, actually that exact point. Cause I get bugged by it. I fully support people's right to carry like that. But if you're the guy in Walmart, that's 350 pounds and you get a 1911 with the hammer back and uncle Mike's Kydex holster dangling off the back of your, your small back, <laughs> you're wrong. Have you seen this before? Have I have seen, seen this, this image multiple before? times. I'm like, you you're can't wrong. Get it out of your mind, no, you? no. It's like, God dang, man, fix your shit. Anyway, that's just my personal opinion. That's awesome. <laughs> no, that's good to know. That is good to know. Uh, yeah, I have. I got my HR 218 because um, I medically retired, so uh, signed by you, actually. Yeah. And um, which is really nice for those that are retired law enforcement. You apply for uh, HR 218 or LEOSA, and that uh, you can carry in all 50 states with that, but you do have to be retired law enforcement. And that you apply through the county that you're in as well. Yeah. Good, yeah, House of Representative Bill 218 uh, under George Bush, I believe. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Senior? Yeah. Uh, junior, I junior. think, actually. Okay. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, the uh, Do you want to talk about this one? You know what? Why not? Or do you have more? <laughs> why, why not? This, is a, it, this was disturbing when you showed it to us yeah. before we got on air. Yeah. I, I had no idea that that was out there. I mean, I've seen a lot of... A lot of stuff that I think kids shouldn't be exposed to, but this blew my mind. Oh, yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, I have an opponent that describes this on his podcast as a sex education book. And if there's one thing that all conservative candidates should agree on, that we have a spiritual battlefield, we got a legislative battlefield, we have a political battlefield, and we have a lawfare battlefield. And in this spiritual battlefield, what I showed you before was the same material that I found in one of our libraries. And we were having arrests. We were having volatility at these community library network meetings. So finally, I put it on my plate and said, hey, would you please kind of take a look at this? There is obviously material against Idaho law here as it pertains to sexually explicit. So I did. I put it on my plate, and I was a little surprised at what I found. So one of the, the number one responsibility of a sheriff is to maintain peace in the county. That's, that's When you look at the Idaho statute of responsibilities of sheriff is to maintain peace. So I thought that I was bringing a community-based policing solution to this particular problem. Volatility, passion. Uh, disturbances to the public peace, and we have arrest. So all I did, all I said was, I supported a bill that if the book had information that violated Idaho Statute 18-1515, that I think it should be in an area for people 18 and over. Oh, my goodness. I didn't say I supported a bill that you had to ban it. I didn't say I supported a bill. You had to burn it or you had to restrict it. Right. I didn't say any of that. All I said was, and you guys, would you agree that that's not a, I don't even want to read this on the air. It's porn. Yeah. I, there's, 
I, they, it, it there's was no disturbing. part of that I want to read. And and the author of that book says that that's appropriate for ages 14 and up. And this was in a teen section, unsupervised <laughs> whatsoever. I have two kids around that age, and there's no way in hell yeah. I would want them reading that. I, I just read one of my daughter's books that she was recommended by a friend, and it had some explicit stuff in there, nothing even close to this. And we had a full sit down and a talk and that, yeah. was, oh, yeah. that book got tossed Yeah, and it wasn't anything near this. If I cut, I, oh. I was walking down the street about a month ago and, um, this, um, lady came up to me and says, you stole those books. And I said, no, I didn't steal those books. Even the community library chairman says I didn't steal those books. You stole those books. I said, no, I didn't steal those books. Those books were returned. She goes, well, I would have no problem with my children reading that material. And I said, well, story time at your house and story time at the Norris household is two different <laughs> story times Dead because man. that is not going to be story time no. at the Norris household. That's for sure. And I felt like it was a pretty reasonable approach. Right. My sheriff hat says, you know, if it contains a sexually explicit material in violation of 18-1515, it should be in an area. Because if you gave that book, Dave, to a 14-year-old outside of an educational structure, you'd be against the law. You'd be violating the law. But because it's in a library or an institution of education, it's okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. So the, yeah, like I, I've heard the argument, you know, the, the liberal side well, and I've got some liberal family members, so I, I hear this stuff a lot. Intellectual freedom. Yeah. Right. Intellectual freedom. Or or they or they just fall on the oh, you're just banning books. Like, no, 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 no. You're not just banning books because it goes against, you know, maybe your religious beliefs or something. This is like literally straight up porn right out of like penthouse. Intellectual intellectual freedom requires education first. Like yeah. you cannot throw something on somebody that doesn't understand values, that doesn't understand the consequences of certain things before and, and allow them to make a decision. You can't do that. You know, the, the big video going around right now um, when they're talking about kids being able to choose their sexuality, they got a, a six-year-old sitting there and the dad puts down $10,000 in cash oh my gosh. and puts down two Oreos. And he tells him, he's like, here's $10,000. Here's two Oreos. What would you like? And the little kid points at the Oreos. He goes, no, no, no. This is $10,000 cash. And he tries to argue with the kid and the kid doesn't. They don't have, <laughs> right. you can have intellectual freedom, but there's a point where you have to, you have to get to a position where you can understand the consequences of reading things like this. You can understand the implications. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no grasp for, for somebody uh, at that age to even understand what this is. And it puts them into a certain thought process. Well, it desensitizes our, our teenagers. Absolutely. And, and especially our, our, my, I have two daughters and they're not going to read that. It's going to desensitize them to, to healthy relationships in the future. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the same thing with law enforcement. You see guys, people ask like, how do you guys make jokes about this? You hear about it. My wife used to always be like, how is oh, it that yeah. you're so emotionless? Yeah. Well, when you see it over and over and over right. and over, you see enough people that have passed away or accidents or, you know, whatever, uh, death, destruction, whatever it is, it eventually just becomes something that's normal a defense mechanism, right? You know, for yeah. levity and what have you. Yeah. yeah. You, you, yeah. you almost have to. And so what happens when your daughter's reading this or anybody, and then now it's just a normal thing. There's no clarity as opposed to what does this mean down the road for me? What am I putting myself up to? Am I, am I exposing myself to diseases or pregnancy well, or, you know, of, any of that future trauma? I mean, a lot of future yes. trauma that's going to occur with that. And all I said was, if it had that material in violation of Idaho statute, let's put it in an area only 18 and over. That seems so incredibly reasonable that I don't understand how anyone could argue that. You're not getting rid of it. You're not banning it. You're just saying it needs to be in an area that it, people know that it's for adults. I would like to ask the same people who think that this is appropriate if my kids can carry a firearm. I would if like this is to, appropriate, then I think my kids should be able to carry a firearm. I would like to ask them to read this to their own kids. Would, would you really read that to your kids? I won't like, even read it on this. Hell no. And most yeah, of the people I don't, on here. Yeah, and this is an explicit podcast, right. but I don't, I'm not reading that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Ah, oh, gosh. Well, you know, I kind of brought you brought you up to date. Yeah, this is a uh, bridge edition. Really good information. I mean, so basically, <laughs> well, so you're up for re-election in May? Yes, I am. Okay. Yep, we're um, a one-party county. 
So that means your vote counts in May. Our candidates are selected in May, and that's where everybody needs to vote in May. The November is just a formality. So okay. every elected official, county, state, federal level, are Republicans here. And the May primary is the only primary, the only voting election that, that really matters. And, and truthfully, too, I'm sure you would say it. Whether somebody's voting for you or somebody else, get out and vote. Yes. We talk educate, about that all the time. Educate yeah. yourself to the, yeah. to the I, issues. And I have never voted so much in my life since I moved to Idaho. I vote every time now. I think that's pretty common. Like, you know, I know a lot of people that are native to this area get very frustrated and, you know, don't California, my Idaho, blah, blah, blah. Well, I read a stat recently that 75% of the people moving here from California specifically uh, are vote Republican. So they are literally making it more of a red state. Yes. And they know how shitty things can get. So, uh, you know, people like me, like I never, I voted in the past, but not consistently. Now yeah. it's like, boom, every time, every time. Cause it's so important that we keep it the way it is. Right. And I am up for reelection and I, I won't um, begrudge my opponent for attacking me online because if I didn't have any full-time patrol deputy experience, if I was never a Sergeant, never a Lieutenant, and never a department head, and never had the executive experience that I have now, I would probably do the same thing he's doing. Mm. But uh, unfortunately, my opponent doesn't have the qualifications to carry my equipment bag to my patrol car. And uh, we'll just leave that right there. Uh, maybe someday when it gets up, has enough passion to do it full time, but this part time stuff isn't going to be we're, an effective leader. We're meeting up with with next Sheriff week. Norris again next yeah. week and we'll and, talk a little uh, more about your right. yeah. yeah and uh bruce matari will yep. be here so um that'll be a good conversation we'll bruce, focus a little bruce more on the campaign too. kind of get your feel on on what you you know any changes that you think need to be made uh how the last four years went everything else because that's important i think people need to know those things oh yeah hey uh, this is uh, uh i enjoy being your law order and freedom sheriff and this is freedom's last stand right here that's what it feels like right that. um yeah it's oh, i had something i was gonna say and it slipped my mind I got one last thing and then yeah. you can, maybe it'll come to me in that. Go. So something that I'm really passionate about, you know, it's funny. Uh, <clears throat> I always tell people I got in more fights as a, a fireman <laughs> down in San Bernardino and, you know, in, in that County than I did up here when I was in law enforcement, I had some very oh, respectful yeah. criminals. Um, and, uh, but I will say, I tell to my kids, my kids starting to drive and everything else. What is your, what would you tell people? Because obviously one of the biggest issues that we have is when law enforcement loses the respect that they're due and they're not able to do their job successfully, it starts to create a little bit of a boundary. People get uncomfortable. We always talk about traffic stops are the most dangerous things you do. You don't know who the people are behind the wheel, who the people are in the car, anything else. What would you say to people when they get stopped by law enforcement in Kootenai County? How should they interact? What are the things that they should do? You know, it's kind of, programmed in in myself and probably both of you whenever i get stopped even if i get stopped today i put my hands on the steering wheel because generally i'm carrying a, a firearm and there's a lot of different dynamics going on um, that we may not know what's in that officer's mind so i always put my hands on the steering wheel and say uh, when the officer approaches and i say hey i'm i have a firearm i'm a off-duty law enforcement officer and that, that helps out a lot. Mm. Yeah. That, takes that does the, help out a lot. Yep. Takes the, yeah. Takes the, de-escalates, you know, the, cause the officer, you know, having been on that a thousand times, um, you know, there's always that moment where you're like, all right, what am I walking up on here? And there's right. that tension and, and it, yeah. Just keep and, your hands where you can see them. And, uh, right. Yeah. My kids know they're starting to drive right now. I said, when you get pulled over, I want all four of your windows down before they even walk up there and want your hands on the steering yes, wheel, please leave them down. Let them see everybody in the car and just listen to what they say. It doesn't matter if you get put in handcuffs. Okay. It doesn't matter. They'll sort everything out, but don't, I mean, let them do their jobs. That's what they're there to do. If I think personally, if our law enforcement, if our deputies feel more comfortable doing their jobs and they have the respect of the public, they're going to be safer. We're going to be safer. It's going to be better for everybody. That's, that's better than what I tell. I tell my kids to just yell out. Do you know who my dad is? <laughs> Right. I don't know. We'll see if it works. You know, there's a common nexus to 99.9% .9 of all of our significant encounters, whether they're significant injury, whether they're lethal encounters. And it comes to obstructing a peace officer. Hmm. And 
there's a lot of special interest groups that don't want to talk about what the, what their client did. I don't know. Well, wait a minute. He was resisting and then he was pulling the officer in the car while he was driving away. Well, yeah, but he only got stopped for no license plate. That old line. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> he was resisting arrest. He was putting the officer at harm, but nobody wants to have them. Well, there's some people that want to have that conversation. And that's why those encounters led to either a significant injury or death was because they were resisting or obstructing yeah. a peace officer. Yeah. Very frustrating. Yeah. And the other thing, the last thing I was going to say, we talked about this. I think we, we were just talking about this is you never know, like you said, you never know where the law enforcement officer is at that point. The truth is, is that these guys go out every day and they deal with 15, 20 worst days of their lives. And that's what they deal with all day long is going to work and dealing with the negative over and over and over. So it's extremely hard when that's what you're dealing with all the time. It's almost a breath of fresh air when you have somebody that even if they think it's a stupid violation for getting pulled over or stopped, they're just respectful and they let the officer do their job. Yeah. It goes so far. Right. That, that officer may very well have just cleared a dead child call. And then, you know, you're like, well, wow, she's such a dick. It's like, well, right. Give him a little grace. <laughs> Absolutely. Because <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. So. You know, we deal with the worst people on their worst days and we deal with the best people on their worst days. Yeah. And we just don't know what's going on in the officers calls for service prior to that. You know, what's going on uh, with the individual that we're stopping. So yeah, there, there's some protocol that we would like to see right. followed when we contact them. Yeah. It's good to educate the public too, for sure. Um, well, Shall we call it? I uh, really appreciate you coming here to our studio in my basement and uh, joining us. <laughs> and and is I'm, Joe Biden here? Somewhere? He, <laughs> he, didn't he run for election in the basement too? Oh boy, <laughs> he's in the closet. I'll let him out later. Um, yeah, really, it's great to get this information straight from the top. Like we, I really appreciate that. I also I remembered what I was going to say now. Just perfect to me. Uh, really appreciate the fact that you're always in the community. I bump into you all the time, um, you know, just downtown at a coffee shop or something. And that visibility and just you being having that access to community members, whether it's the old lady jamming you up about the library, that's not cool. But uh, most people, I think, probably shake your hand and give you a thank you. And, and it, it's just nice to have you out there and see you in public. So thank you for that. One of my yeah. biggest compliments was from a, a gentleman. I was walking into Nosworthy's. Can you, are you allowed to plug like that? Oh sorry. yeah. 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 Okay. We, we do so, a lot of that. So we, I Mention. walked into Nosworthy, <laughs> which has a great hamburger. Deal. I have never eaten. I got to go check it out now. So I'm walking in and this 90 year old guy said, Hey, he goes, you're the sheriff, aren't you? I go, yes, sir. I am. And he goes, you know what? He goes, I was born and raised here. And today's my 93rd birthday. And you're the most community engaged sheriff this county's ever had. That's oh, awesome. <laughs> oh, that by the way, great. I just read the other day that Wyatt Earp was a briefly Cooney County, County, County Sheriff. sheriff yes. Really? Absolutely. So there you go. Put, oh, yeah. Hitting you against Earp, you had more community <laughs> oh, yeah. presence than he did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was up. There's your Shoshone fact for the day. Area. Shoshone at one time was part of Cooney County. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was up in the Shoshone area. That this was funny. after Tombstone. Yeah. Okay. So this was after Tombstone, and uh, he left here, and he went to Los Angeles, and that's where his final bearing was burial place was so there you wow. go you're in the same lineage as white earth wow. <laughs> pretty cool not, i did not think of it that yeah way. yeah wow. just it just uh i read that the other day and i was like i gotta share that with him that's awesome yeah uh well let's call it thank you uh everyone for listening and thanks bob for coming out and being part of the community appreciate you My pleasure. absolutely and we will be back next week next week with bob as well so we'll talk a little bit more about his uh his reelection and um just everything they're doing with your campaign and and anything else you want to talk about with that? That'll be good because Bruce, I know when I had Bruce on here last time, we talked about, uh, you know, budgeting, things like that. And some of the issues in Kootenai County as far as getting money to you guys. So. Yeah. And when Bruce is introduced, he likes to be introduced as uh, Bob Norris's campaign manager. I will remember so, that. So the, and he, in fact, you don't even have to say his name. <laughs> this, this was Bob Norris' campaign manager. The... He's a smart guy, by the way. I, I felt rather... <laughs> rather dull talking to him i was like wow i'm glad you're uh you're in charge of stuff You're rather dull talking to me I so know. well it's your smart guy too <laughs> i'm just here for the for the jokes and the good looks buddy uh once again thank you sir it's been a my, pleasure my pleasure yep